Affairs of State, a program produced through the cooperative efforts of the departments of the state government of North Carolina and the Raleigh studio of WUNC Television. This program is dedicated to a greater understanding of the responsibilities and services of the various departments of state government to the people of North Carolina. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> My name is Jack Benson. I'm a reporter. Now, a reporter's job is essentially to tell stories, and tonight that's what I want to tell you, a story. I've been doing a series of feature articles on departments of the state government of North Carolina. The last assignment I had was uh, at the State Department of Archives and History. As I arrived in front of the education building, uh, I expected something of a routine assignment, but I shortly discovered that I was in the midst of one of the most fascinating and intriguing operations of the state. My assignment began with an interview with Dr. Crittenden, the director of the department. After I found my way, asked directions from several people, I wended my way into the office of Dr. Crittenden. Dr. Crittenden, how are you? How are you? Jack Benson. Chris Crittenden, and what can we do for you? Well, uh, I think uh, we had a conversation by phone the other day. I gave you some impression of uh, what I'd like to find out. As you know, I'm doing a series of articles on the state government of North Carolina. I want to find out something about the Department of Archives and History. Well, I wonder if we might just have a little conversation about something of the purpose of your department other matters you might want to mention, and I believe you mentioned we might take a little tour of the various divisions of your department. We're very happy to do it, Mr. Benson. Have a seat. Thank you. I think first, Dr. Crittenden, if you'd just give us some idea of the purpose of your division as you see it. Well, to put it in a nutshell, Mr. Benson, this is the State Historical Agency the agency of the state of North Carolina that tries to look after Tar Heel history in all its aspects. And it is quite a colorful history. Well, we certainly think so. You have the job of correlating all that information, among other things I think that you indicated. That's right. We have, uh, as you know, the site of the first English colonies in the New World. We have the oldest state university and many other things of which we are very proud. Yes. I wonder, Dr. Crittenden, uh, before we get uh, involved in these various divisions of your department, if you wouldn't want to talk to us rather generally, uh, I was impressed, for example, by this building in which you're located here, the education building as it's known. It's one of the newer buildings in this uh, uh, capital city group. Could you tell us something about how long you've been in the building? and? Uh, other things about it? Well, it looks like a fairly new building, and yet we've been in here, Mr. Benson, for 19 years. We moved over here in 1939. Before that, we were in this, on the second floor of what is now the State Library Building, and before that, we were in the Capitol, had two rooms in the Capitol. You were uh, anxious, I believe, to mention something about your outstanding staff here. I think you intimated that you were quite proud of them. Would you? Tell us something about them, about the size of your staff. Well, uh, Jack, if you pardon my calling you that, I think we have about the finest staff here that, that you can find in the state government or anywhere. You, we are very proud of them, and you'll see something of some of them in a few minutes. We have 40 people on our staff at the present time. And uh, the activities that they engage in are certainly uh, of various and diverse natures, I believe. That's Some right. Quite remote from the others. That's right. I would like to say that the department is governed by an executive board of seven persons appointed by the governor, and our chairman is Mr. McDaniel Lewis of Greensboro. Also, in order to get it in the record, I would like to point out that this department is largely 
made by one very outstanding man, Dr. Robert D.W. Connor, who was the first executive head. And he did such a splendid job in that connection that when President Roosevelt looked around for the first archivist of the United States, he has selected Dr. Connor for that job. I see. Well, are there other general matters that you'd like to tell us about, Dr. Crittenden? Well, we... I'd like to say this. Uh, in the beginning, the functions of this agency, which originally was known as the North Carolina Historical Commission, and which was established in 1903, the original functions were largely to collect and preserve records, archives, that is, official manuscripts, and private uh, papers of the people who figured in the history of the state, to collect and preserve such papers and to publish them. More recently, we have gone into a number of other activities, such as maintaining a historical museum. You'll see something of that in a so little bit. I think bit. that's a thing that uh, many of the citizens of the state are certainly more familiar with. I believe the public knows the whole of history, as it's called, better than any other phase of our activities. And we do have that to look forward to on our tour of uh, the, the museum we'll and all We'll see that history. a little bit later. Good. Then we maintain historic sites. We put up these markers you see along the highways pointing the way to places of historic interest. And uh, in general, we seek to serve as a sort of clearinghouse for historical interests and activities in North Carolina. Well, I don't want to keep you too long because I know you want to go on a tour and see some That's of our activities. We go fir we'll go first to our historic sites division. Then we'll go and see something about publications. Then we'll see some of the old records and how they are handled. Then something about modern records. And finally, we will end up in the Hall of History. So if you're ready now, Jack, we'll go on this tour. I am ready, Dr. Crittenden. Uh, I can't help but ask about one thing before we go, though I've been admiring this desk. We've been talking about the museum and Hall of History here. This looks as if it might be a museum piece itself. Could you tell us a little something about it? Well, it's, it's a real uh, his, historical relic, if, if I may say so. I hope nobody will comment that a relic sits behind the desk. <laughs> but anyhow, this desk goes back to the Columbian Exposition at Chicago in 1893. And it's made from Hollywood that comes from Roanoke Island, came from Roanoke Island. And the carving, you see a number of, of uh, <coughs> pictures on there were done by Miss Kate Cheshire of Tarboro. And uh, here, incidentally, is the, is the gavel that came with the desk. We don't use that as a weapon, though, please Jack. Don't, please don't. There was a chair, but it's lost. And I want to show you, um, up here on the front, is one of the carvings. You see there the picture of a deer. The tradition, the story is, that Virginia Dare, who, as you know, was the first child of English parents born in the New World, when she died, she turned into a white doe, and for a number of years, she ran around Roanoke Island. So there you have one of the pictures on this desk. Now let's move on to well, the... May I ask one more yes, question in connection with it? Three questions. <laughs> Thank you. you. One will be fine. Uh, would there have been a chair with this desk? There was a chair, and uh, it was lost before the desk ever came to us. This is an example of how certain items like this can become lost and find, right. finally wind That's up right. in your department. This desk was once thrown out on a junk heap, and, but was saved, and we are very thankful that it was. That happens all too often with that sort of thing. I'm it's sure all it. too often. That's right. Now, Dr. Crittenden, what will be the first department that we will visit? The we first division, first I believe it is. The, uh, historic Sites Division. Mm -hmm. So let's walk down this way. <coughs> <coughs> Mr. Tallon, we have here Mr. Jack Benson. How you doing? Mr. Are you? Mr. That's Tallon fair. is our historic site superintendent, and he'll tell you something about his program. Good. Very glad to have you with us. Thank you. I am interested, first of all, in just getting a general idea of what you feel to be the purpose of your division and some of the areas that it encompasses. We work mainly with the historical restoration projects. That includes uh, historic houses, battlefields an Indian site. Uh, we even have a covered bridge that we're interested in, too. We have 16 of these projects that we work with. Uh, the state owns 10 of them. The state puts uh, financial aid into five others, and six of them we administer ourselves and are fully responsible for those six. Do, you, do I take it that the nature of your 
job then is to reconstruct and maintain these sites and markers? That's pretty much it, yes. Uh -huh. well, I see uh, quite a number of pictures on the wall over here. Could you give us some uh, idea of what these pictures do represent? Are these all uh, state historic uh, no, sites and no, markers? A few of these are, are run by the federal government and one or two by private organizations, but several of them are our sites. Uh, of course, our projects are in the field, and the best we can do today is show you some pictures. Um, may I ask at this point, uh, uh, how is it determined that a historical site would be maintained by the federal government or by the state of North Carolina? Well, in general, the federal government has taken uh, sites that were of outstanding national significance. Our basic criterion is state I significance. See. We're interested in state things. Uh, we can show you some examples. Right, uh, here, for example, we have the house in the horseshoe. That's a pre-revolutionary farmhouse down in Moore County. It sits in a, a large horseshoe bend of the Deep River, and that's where it gets that name. Mm -hmm. uh, during the Revolution, a fair-sized battle, a good brisk battle, was fought there between Whigs and Tories. The Whigs got in the house, and the Tories tried to drive them out. Uh, poured fire into it. Uh, bullet holes still are there to show the... Uh, uh, now, is this, has this been reconstructed to be in the state as we see it here, from uh, a more decrepit state, shall I say? Uh, yes, it was decidedly more decrepit, and it's been very well uh, restored uh, by the Moore County Historical Society. If I might break in there and say a word, uh, Sam, I think that Jack would be interested to know that uh, one of the leaders, perhaps the leader of the movement to restore this house, was no less than Ms. Ernest Ives of Southern Pines, Many of us know her as the sister of Adlai Stevenson, former governor of Illinois, and incidentally, she's going to make a luncheon speech here in Raleigh tomorrow. President of the North Carolina Histor uh, Preservation of Antiquities Society this year. She's making a fine contribution to... She works closely with our work. Here. Yes. Good. Uh, do you have other yes, pictures here? Yes. Uh, over here, we have a picture of Alamance Battleground. Uh, we, we have the field with the uh, monument in it. Uh, that was the site of the battle in 1771 between the Regulators and Governor Tryon's uh, militia forces. Mm -hmm. The Regulators were a bunch of uh, frontier reformers. They were dissatisfied with certain practices of government, and they undertook to correct things. And on this field, they, uh, they met uh, violence with uh, violence, so to speak. They, won they lost the battle, but they won the campaign. In 1776, most of their demands for reform were included in our first This seems to have been true of the American armies in several battlefields, wasn't it? They lost yeah, the battle that's, that's, won the campaign. That's been repeated many times in history. If yeah. I'm break in there, you mentioned Governor Tryon. What does that make us think of, of course, in historic sites? Well, it does make us think of Tryon Palace, which is undoubtedly the biggest single project going on in the state right now. We'll, uh, Are we going to have a chance to yes, see something Yes, well, like I don't believe we have any pictures on hand now, but... Uh, <laughs> Uh, Tryon Palace illustrates uh, something else about our program. Uh, before we can get started on these restorations, we have to do a great deal of research ordinarily. We're sort of like an iceberg. A lot of our work doesn't show. Uh, for example, Tryon Palace involves a lot of uh, background documentary research, and these two big volumes are full of notes taken from contemporary sources all about Tryon Palace. Uh, what uh, what are some of the uh, fields of specialization that people in your division engage in? Do you have archaeologists, actually, in your division? Yes, we have two projects which are archaeological, primarily in nature, Town Creek Indian Mound and Brunswick Town. So we have archaeologists at those places. We have uh, historians, researchers. And then uh, somebody has to know a little bit about restoration. It would appear then that the, the divisions of Dr. Crittenden's department are diverse and the uh, various fields in the divisions are diverse as well. You mentioned Town Creek Village. Can we get some uh, idea of what that uh, is? Yes. Over here on the wall, if you'll excuse me. Yes. Here we have uh, Town Creek Indian Mound uh, Village. We don't usually call it that. Before uh, 1937, they had there the uh, well-known mound. It was the weathered uh, earth uh, mound, this right here. And that was all that, uh, all the, that was the only visible remains of it. They picked up broken pots and arrowheads and all that kind of thing. So they knew it was an Indian mound, uh, Indian site, right on the banks of, of Little River here. About, uh, would you be able to estimate about what era these Indians would have lived, this is certainly before the time of the yeah. white man, would you be able to guess 
about how long? Well, uh, <coughs> we didn't know any of that when we started. We had the mound, but we put, uh, but archaeologists uh, went to work on that some 20 years ago, and they have dug the site up in 10-foot squares, and so we, now we know a great deal about it. We do know that those, that Indians have occupied that site, site for several thousand years. Mm -hmm. We know that in the 16th century, that would be the 1500s, they had this kind of a setup there. Palisade wall enclosing uh, uh, an organization of buildings, the temple mound with a temple on it, burial houses out in the uh, opening, a little square ground here we call it for ceremonial purposes and various other buildings. I presume uh, that the white men as they came to this country incorporated much of the same sort of thing in their forts and settlements that they built. Uh, uh, perhaps they took modified, perhaps the on the basis of what they knew. You know. Incidentally, if I may say a word, you mentioned the 16th century. These Indians were right here when the Sir Ronald Roy sent his colonies over to Roanoke Island. So uh, we might establish them at, at that time too. I'm quite interested in what this gentleman is doing over here. Could we get an idea of his? This is work? Mr. Gelback, Mr. Benson. He's working on the Hello? Bentonville Battleground Project. Our Civil War battleground. Uh, battle was fought there in March 1865, and it was the last really big uh, battle of the war, the last organized battle, the last one in which the Confederate Army uh, chose a spot and uh, initiated the attack. And it was also the last effort made, and the only serious effort made, to stop uh, General Sherman. He was going up to join Grant, and the two would overwhelm Lee. Mr. Gilback has been doing research for quite a while on this. Uh, a lot of book research, uh, primarily in the official records of the War of the Rebellion, 130 volumes of these, plus a lot of maps and other books. And he's also explored the, uh, the field uh, to a great extent, and he's found some things which I believe you This is, this is what fascinates me right here. These are the kinds of relics that you do find in battlefield areas. Yes, they've this all been found within this <coughs> last year. This seems to be an old bayonet here. I can recognize that pretty clearly. It's pretty rusty. They're 93 years in the ground. <coughs> and these, I presume, are... Uh, musket balls, many balls. Uh -huh, they pretty struck something and flattened out. Probably this wood, yes. Yeah. Here's an example of one here tree, in the wood. It's taken from a tree, an old turpentine tree. Mm -hmm. It's still in good shape, and for some reason that didn't flatten out. I don't know why. Now, do you ordinarily, on such a field as this, establish some sort of museum and display these items here? Oh, yes, we shall in due time. Yes. I say a word there. Mr. Tarleton mentioned the uh, title of this series as the War of the Rebellion Records. I would like to say that Mr. Tarleton did not give that title to the series. That is the official title. Uh, uh, Mr. Tarleton, I think perhaps we may have to move on from your division, but I think there's one more gentleman working here that perhaps we should see and get a picture of what he's doing. This is Mr. Sawyer, Mr. Benson. Uh, Mr. Sawyer's Sorry. working on Acock Birthplace, birthplace of Governor Charles Acock, uh, our great educational governor. He was born there on, in, on this farm, in this little farmhouse in 1859. Mr. Sawyer's been doing a great deal of research and books and other records, too. And right now, he's uh, working out a layout plan for the uh, restoration area. We have the old buildings down there. We have to move them back to the original site. To the original and site. Sheds and porches. And, and uh, considerable restoration has to be has undertaken. To well, you might say then uh, that your division, in effect, has the business of restoring uh, Indian villages, battlegrounds, historic uh, houses. houses of various kinds. Do you have a picture to show us of this uh, particular? Uh, yes. Over here, we have uh, a picture of the house on that well, this, this, now yeah, this it's not the whole the house. You see, it's just the uh, center part, the hulk of it. Well, this looks lost somewhat like a corn crib. Uh, uh, has this been used for something other than the dwelling uh, house since its original state? Yes, it's in, in Ms. Acock's pigsty oh, now, as a matter of fact. But, and it has been used as a tobacco packing house and for other outbuilding purposes. And we have the uh, old stable, too, the uh, building that kept the horses and mules in. In fact, I believe there's a mule standing out in front of it now. That was also there during Acock's childhood, and we're going to probably move that across and include it in the restoration project. Would you be able to guess, in the case of a building like this, uh, when you finally complete the restoration, if that's ever done, uh, just how much of the original will be incorporated there? 25 percent? About 50 percent in that About case. 50%. The, from the plate up is the original 
structure, the uh, the uh, lower part has been replaced a couple of times. Well, this is a fascinating aspect of the department, I think, and it's uh, an aspect that people all over the state can view because these places are nearby where they live. They don't have They're to come to the state capital the state. to see them. The and you the do mines. have a fascinating department. Dr. Crittenden, shall we move on to the well, next I division? the time has come. Mr. Tarlin, thank you very much. Thank you. Glad to have you, Mr. Benson. Thank you. Come back. Uh, what's the next department now we go to? We move over to the Division of Publications, and Mr. D.L. Corbett is the head of that division. And before we get there, I want to tell you that next Tuesday will mark the 34th anniversary of the date when Mr. Corbett went to work for this department. You're Way back on the April 1st, 1924. So now let me take you and introduce you to Mr. D.L. Corbett. Mr. Corbett, Mr. how are you? Glad to see you. See you. Apparently you are the senior member of the Department of Archives yes, and History. Yes, I have been here longer than anyone else on our staff. I wish you would just tell me something about uh, the work of your division, what you consider to be its main purposes, and give us some examples of the various kinds of things you do. It, it is the Division of Publications, I assume, that all this vast array of things we have behind us do represent the work that you do. Yes, one of the main functions of the department is the publication of historical material uh, dealing with the history of the state. Since we have uh, been in existence, we have published 35 documentary volumes. Here is one here, the papers of Wiley P. Mangum. There are five volumes in this series and uh, it uh, deals with Mangum, when he was legislator, judge, and United States Senator, and Speaker Pro Tem of the United States Senator. There's five volumes in this series. I noticed when I came into the building that you have a large glass display case in the lobby. I assume that some of the material is of more general interest to the general public, others to historians, and you have varying degrees of that. Yes, uh, I think that is true. Uh, we have published this uh, book here on the First book ever published in North Carolina. We repro reproduced this in 1900. I'd like to get uh, a picture of that cover there. This is uh, a, a very colorful cover. And this is the first uh, book published in North Carolina. Uh, reproduced in facsimile. Reproduced in facsimile. In 1949 was the uh, bicentennial celebration of printing in North Carolina. And the first book was published by James Davis at Newbern. When we were thinking about that anniversary, we could not find a copy of this book in the United States. We did find a copy in England, and we had it uh, photocopied, and from that we have made plates and reproduced this in facsimile, just the same as it was uh, in... Well, what sort of research would go into locating this uh, manuscript, or, uh, this original manuscript in England? Would uh, you have to do some considerable correspondence? With yes, it was done by correspondence, Mr. <coughs> William S. Powell, who at one time was in this department, but now at the Library at University of North Carolina, uh, located a copy of this in England, and through that source, we obtained the photocopy so that we could reproduce that. Mm -hmm. Have you other examples of well, publications? Uh, what about this, uh, this thing right here? This is fascinating. This kind of uh, thing you do? Is the page one of the Carolina Charter of 1663. We purchased the original of that uh, in England for a little over $6,000, and we have it in a case out in the Hall of History. We have re several requests for photocopies of this, so we decided we would reproduce this by printing, and on the page here, we have the pictures of eight, seven of eight large proprietors and of King Charles II, who granted the land to the Lord Proprietors. And on the reverse of this, we have the complete text of uh, the Charter. This is available for anyone who is interested in it. Mr. Colbert, if I may point out here, we have an original pen and ink sketch of Charles II of England, who of course granted the Charter to the eight Lords Proprietors. He is, uh, according to history, was pretty much of a roué. And I think if you look at this picture, you can't see it too well. But looks pretty dissipated. He, he's I pretty, so they say, anyhow. <laughs> Maybe it's the costume and the wig there. Here is another pipe book that we have published, The Formation of the North Carolina Counties, and uh, it has been quite useful to 
the federal government in acquiring the land for the Great Smoky Mountains National Park and also to the State Highway Commission in making the maps of the 100 counties. In addition to that, many people have uh, used it, and particularly genealogists, when they are searching for their family records. Mr. 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 Corbett, excuse me, is too modest to say so, but this is his own, he, he did this book, he compiled the information. I'm and sure it's one of the most valuable publications the department has issued. I'm sure if we investigated some of these closely, we'd find a number of his work. This is the North Carolina Historical Review, established in 1924. It is a scholarly magazine and issued quarterly on a paid-up subscription basis. I wonder if we could turn that right around this way. <laughs> I would like to say that uh, Mrs. Elizabeth Welburn, at the present time, or for three years, has been doing the editorial work on this um, magazine for us. Well, you know, that uh, leads me to ask uh, Dr. Corbett, I would like to meet some of the members of your department. Perhaps we can, you can introduce them to us. Uh, uh, well <coughs> now, the, the lady that you're about to introduce us to has largely responsible for this historical review that you've just shown That's us. right. And uh, she is right here at the next table. Uh, while, while we get over into there, I wonder, this seems to be a book of some sort for uh, children particularly. Yes, this is a book that we uh, titled Picture Book of Tar Heel Authors. We had many requests for, from school children for information about Tar Heel Authors. So last summer, we uh, uh, got Professor Walsh of State College to write this, and we have reproduced this, and you might see that we have it illustrated, but each... Call it, excuse me, I believe we're... I believe we're Ms. Wilburn on will you tell us who these ladies are so we can get an idea of their names and some of the responsibilities well, they have in your division? The uh, person on my left, first person on my left is Mrs. Elizabeth W. Wilburn. She's the lady who does the work on the North Carolina Historical Review. And the next lady is Miss Beth Crabtree, and she is doing a pamphlet on the North Carolina governors. And I believe we have another young lady now that we're visiting with. Can you tell us what this she does and who she is? On my right is Miss Joanne Roberts. She is my secretary, and she mails these uh, volumes out when we get requests. And we do get requests from many people every day, school children, librarians, and uh, other individuals who are interested in the history of the state. I hesitate to throw this in, but uh, what would you guess would be the budget for postage alone, that is, the mailing of this, would you estimate, of these various publications? Would well, it go uh, up in the hundreds of thousands? Uh, it's pretty difficult to do that, but I would say several hundred dollars a month. Mm -hmm. uh, as you know, postage uh, rates have increased uh, many times in the last few years. Second well, this class young lady is plenty busy mailing out uh, the various publications all over the state, oh, and throughout yes. the United States, I suppose. And today we mail approximately <coughs> 300 volumes. Uh, th this uh, very day? This very day. These were the, uh, this was volumes of the W.B. Armstead letter book, which recently came from the press. Well, Jack, uh, we thank Mr. Corbett. This is very interesting, but we have to move along. Good. What will be the next division, Dr. Well, Crittenden? Thank you, Dr. Corbett. We next go to the Division of Archives and Manuscripts, and I'm sorry to say that our state archivist who heads that division was unavoidably called out of town. He couldn't be here, but before he left, he found time to make a recording for us, which will be synchronized with a few pictures we're going to show. Good. So now we come to that recording. We have in the archives some 7,000 cubic feet of historical materials of various types. Official public records, private collections, maps, early newspapers, and the like. On a working day, we have as many as 30 or 35 researchers in the search room making use of these records. And here we have uh, some of the 35 or 45 letters that were received in, in a day seeking information from the records. We send out about 4,000 photo prints a year and thousands of feet of microfilm. Now, state law prohibits any public official, state, county, or local, from destroying any public record without the approval of the State Department of Archives and History. Consequently, a record that is adjudged by us to have historical value must either remain in the Office of Origin or be transferred to the archives. We get most of our records this way, that is, by transfer from a state agency, a county, or a municipality. 
For instance, we have the official papers of the governors from the colonial days on down to the present. Here is a picture of Miss Jean Denny, one of our archivists, replacing a container of the papers of the late Governor William B. Umstead. We have some records from 91 of the 100 counties in the state. And in this picture, we see Mrs. Mary Rogers shelving county records. Mrs. Rogers, incidentally, has been with the department for more than 22 years. Now, in addition to the public records, we accept gifts of personal collections. Here in this photograph, for instance, is a very rare document dated 1664 and signed by seven of the eight Lord's proprietors. This and other valuable papers were given us by the late Congressman Thurman Chatham. We have a fine collection of about 2,500 maps, mostly of North Carolina. Here's a photograph of Mrs. Rachel Robinson looking at an 18 and 86 map of Cabarrus County. We also have the finest collection of 18th century North Carolina newspapers in existence. Here's the first known copy of a North Carolina newspaper still in existence. The date, November 15, 1751. The newspaper, the North Carolina Gazette. Now the general public doesn't realize it, but probably 80% of the work of our staff is devoted to the thankless behind the scenes processing that is necessary before a record can be seen by a researcher. Let's follow this process step by step. First, the records are given an atmospheric fumigation to kill insect life that would be injurious to the papers. Here, Leonard Austin and Wilbert Hunter are putting a box of loose papers in the fumigating vault. Second, each item must be examined and analyzed in order to be put in, in a particular category. Here, Mrs. Ruth Haynes Page is analyzing a group of papers that recently came from the dusty attic of a county courthouse nearby. Third, valuable papers in bad shape are repaired through the laminating process. We have one of the 20 barrel laminators in the entire world. And here, Mrs. Betty Watkins is laminating legislative papers for the year 1773. Note the laminating machine in the left background and uh, over at the right, the chemicals used in the deacidification of the paper and ink. Fourth comes the arranging in chronological, alphabetical, subject, or some other logical order. Mrs. Julia McConaughey is shown here arranging the official papers of the late Governor O. Max Gardner. Mrs. McConaughey, incidentally, has been with the department more than 33 years. Fifth, the records are accessioned and cataloged. Here, Miss Carolyn Green is accessioning the personal papers of the late Clarence Griffin, Forest City newspaper editor and also a member of our executive board. Six, the records are placed on the shelves by call numbers. And here we see Mrs. Rachel Robinson shelving a group of county records and the fireproof, air-conditioned, dehumidified stacks areas. Finally now, the records are ready for use in the search room. A researcher comes to the search room, registers, and studies the various finding aids. Then he asks for and receives from the attendant the particular record in which he is interested. Materials must be used in the search room, and they may not be taken out. So there you have a rundown of our work. But for persons interested in the records and the archives and policies towards their use, we have two little leaflets that we're glad to send out at no charge. In them, we try to give an overall picture of our program and also to give suggestions on how to begin historical research. One of them, services to the public, is of particular interest to the genealogist. Well, this is the recording, Jack, that Mr. H.G. Jones left for us. Uh, one little slip of the tongue I want to call your attention to. I'm sure many of the audience noticed it, that the picture of the map showed Catawba County, and Mr. Jones said Cabarrus County. Well, that's not too bad. We there hope. is a difference. And now, Dr. Crittenden, who is this lady that we have turned our back on here? You'll forgive us, won't you? Uh, will you introduce me to her and tell me something of what her division is and what she's going to show us this Well, evening? this lady is Mrs. Fanny Memory Blackwelder, and she is our State Records Center Supervisor, Mr. Benson, Mrs. Blackwelder. I'm glad to meet you. Thank you. I'm glad to meet you. That's quite an impressive title. Well, we are dealing primarily with modern records. You know, all the state agencies have record problems now that more uh, 
records are, more records are created as agencies expand their functions, and so they give out a space, and we come in to help them solve their problems. And this is a um, money-saving proposition, and it also assures that records will be kept in the archives when they have historical value. So in effect, we've been talking about historic things up to this point and the uh, carrying on of their memory. Now we're talking about things that are happening today, and yet that's we need to keep a record of them, and that's, that's right. essentially what you do. And we have three archivists <coughs> who go into agencies when they're having records problems, and they write a brief administrative history of the agency, which shows how the functions of the department relate to the records which are created. Then they work out an inventory of the records, go through the records of the department, and write a brief description of the records and work out with the officials creating the records a schedule to show what's going to be done with each series of records. You know, some records will come obsolete after a short time and there's no point in cluttering up valuable office space with them, so they are destroyed maybe after two years, sometimes after six months. Other records are sent to our record center and you uh, know that that is a low-cost building because you've seen it and you know that the um, building itself is not as expensive as high-cost office space, and so semi-current records are saved in the record center for as long as 20 years. Right now we have about 14 to 15,000 cubic feet of records there, and there's constant turnover. As records become obsolete, those are destroyed, and if they're confidential, they're shredded before they are sold as packing. How do, how, he might be interested to know, how do we shred records? We have a shredding machine which uh, tears them up into little tiny strips about an eighth of an inch wide and of course it, then the material is, information is completely obliterated before the records are sold. Essentially you think, excuse mm -hmm. me, makes you think of a breakfast cereal but we won't go into that at this moment. Well essentially the point of your division is to see that nothing gets lost that shouldn't be lost. That's and right. That those not things that should be lost. Are, that are obsolete and not kept in valuable space and the things that are of historical value will be saved. Now you've yeah. mentioned the fact that you have a tremendous problem of space here, and undoubtedly you do, the government being as complex as it is and the records being so elaborate. What is this that you hold in your hand here? Well, we do a <coughs> microfilming for a number of state agencies. We now microfilm about five million images each year for about 20 state agencies, and we make two copies of the film. The agency gets <coughs> a copy, that is the agency which created the records, and we have a copy which we retain as a security copy. Maybe you'd be interested in seeing a microfilming machine. Mrs. I Cook would indeed, these young ladies. Maybe you'd like to see her <coughs> film. Perhaps we get a closer look at what she's doing there. And you tell us something of what's going on here as this machine clicks? This machine is now filming checks at the rate of about uh, 400 a minute. These are some records from the State Board of Education. We, as I said, we film for a number of state agencies. Of course, the uh, film, the material is reduced about 40 times when it's on film. You can see this roll of film, which shows how small the image looks on the film. And here is the uh, one of the original documents, so you can see the difference. Uh in I'd be curious to ask right here, Dr. Crittenden, if we may see, here's a filing cabinet, about how much space in this filing cabinet would a roll of microfilm like that take in ordinary correspondence or... A four-drawer cabinet of records can be filmed on three little rolls of microfilm. Three of these here. Mm -hmm. Just so look at them. Let's, let's hold them up. All the records in that cabinet can go, can be filmed in, on this space. In other words... Ninety-nine percent. You can't percent. do better than that. Even ivory soap is not much better than that. Of course, then after the records are microfilmed to read them, you have to put them on a microfilm reader. And yes, we have. Uh, I assume that was some sort of viewer there, and this that does magn uh, magnify. That's right. It magnifies the film so that to, the is image this life size or larger than life size? Right. It <coughs> can be magnified to the back to its original size. Sometimes it magnified maybe half the original size. It depends on the lens that you have in the machine. I right see. now, this is magnifying the document to its original size. Thank you. Are there other facts that you'd like to give us about your particular division? Well, we have uh, a little humor now and then. You never know what people are going to file. Not long ago, we found a kidney stone filed in with some <laughs> files. A uh, person trying to claim disability had <laughs> sent in her kidney Would it be stone, possible so to microfilm a kidney stone? No, we did <laughs> not Don't think you'd want to attempt to that. It. Well, it's a small item, perhaps. Uh, did, you, did you shred it? 
company, we just threw it away and wrote a little note, which was them, saying that the uh, claimant had attached the kidney stone and it was in the file, but it could not be photographed. I didn't, I didn't mean to build on your humorous illustration. It was uh, certainly an example of some of the fascinating things that happened here. Dr. Well, Crittenden, are we ready to move to the next division? There's one point I want to make before we move on, Jack, if we may go back a little bit. Something was said a while ago about laminating, and we showed a laminating machine. Do you know what laminating is? Uh, it seems to me I've read in the advertisement some of these companies you can send your driver's license or baby's pictures and have them laminated. I assume this means enclosing them in some sort of plastic for That's preservation. That's what it amounts to. We can take an old document that is just about to fall to pieces, place it between two sheets of cellulose acetate, apply heat and pressure, and in just a few seconds, the document is as strong as it ever was. We have what is known as a laminating machine. You saw a picture of it a little while ago. Uh, it cost us $10,000 several years ago. Today, with prices having advanced as they have, it would cost at least twice that much. When, uh, when did you begin to have this kind of thing, Dr. Crittenden? I, I imagine your problems were almost insurmountable in, in preserving these things before you got such Well, equipment. for many years, before we had such a machine, we had a, a special employee to repair documents. It was all done by hand. She used Japanese tissue to do it. And uh, it was very, very slow. We can do it much more rapidly with the laminating machine. I'm sure your operation has been facilitated considerably by the invention of new machi machines. Such it as certainly that. has. Incidentally, this machine is made by a man in Richmond who invented it. And uh, he has made now about 20 of them. They're in the United States. They're one or two in South America. There are two or three in Europe. And I believe recently one was installed in the Vatican. That's interesting. <laughs> you know, I can't help noticing, Dr. Crittenden, that that looks like a place with which I am already familiar, the whole of history. Are we about ready to move into that division? Do you have anything further, Ms. Blackwell? I mm. might say that we have this little leaflet on records management that we distribute to people who would like to know more about it. Perhaps you'd like to see I this. I would indeed. Read more I'll about our program. I'll try to <laughs> fill in a little bit on what I've learned here tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you. Now let's, Shall we go? let's walk on into the Hall of History or State Historical Museum. Well, this is the place that uh, so many people are familiar with. I think I'm tangled a little bit there. Yes, uh, this is what the public sees more than any other aspect of our work. I wish we could show you these things. We haven't time, but we have here the best collection of silver south of the Potomac River. We got it, we purchased it a short time ago from Dr. George B. Cutton of Chapel Hill. Is that the whole... Uh the whole collection here came from that one no, source? No, not, uh, not, but we have some others. Over yeah, here to the left is the Mayflower Cup. Yes, Over I there is the Sir Walter Raleigh Cup, but they tell us to move on. And now we're coming into an area which I believe is considerably more familiar to many of the school children of the state, Hall of History. That's right. And I believe we're moving into this section here, and you'll have to come in here, Dr. Crittenden, and tell me something about what's going on here. All right, now we come to Mrs. Joy Jordan, who is the head of our Hall of History, Ms. Mr. Jordan? Jack Benson. I, it seems a little dark in this corner. Could it be possible that we could get a little more light so that we might see? This is the most, one of the most fascinating aspects of the whole department. And we want to be sure that we see all the items here. Will you tell us something about what you two ladies are doing in this particular section here? I see quite a conglomerate uh, may I say, mass of material on the table? Mr. Benson, this is a new collection mm. that has just come in. Very obviously, it's the Governor Cherry Collection. And, uh... Can't help but wonder if that's cherry wood. Well, I haven't, I haven't tested it. Well, I, but, uh, I won't it, require it, that it you do so. It's <laughs> just a thought. And Interestingly the, enough, excuse me, when he was running for governor, the symbol was the cherry. Everybody wore a cherry on his lapel. She has a I bunch of I see that there are some artificial yes. ones mm -hmm. here, yes. We have those. And what then would be this? Would you tell me something about what's going on here? This is uh, Bonnie Walker. Bonnie? Who is accessioning this material. Now, there's a word, I'm afraid, uh, that I'm not too familiar with. I've heard it in connection with library use. Is it essentially the same about thing About the same uh, thing. You might just say, 
cataloging. Cataloging or labeling, perhaps. Putting numbers on the material so that we can find it when we want it. And this is, in effect, uh, something of how the material comes in before you get it sorted and in the order that... That's right. That's to. what uh, Bonnie is doing. Uh, Bonnie, is there any uh, one thing there that you've selected from that collection that you'd like to show Mr. Benson? Well, this is something well, my husband rubber. finds very interesting, and I'm but sure all men would. Turn it the other way. <laughs> this one? <laughs> It's deactivated. deactivated. It's real. Do you dig? Did, uh, you know, I've been in this uh, museum before, and I know you have quite an arms collection. Uh, all of your arms are deactivated. Yes, sir, they are. Mm -hmm. well, that's and all good. the bullets, too. Good. Now, I find something like this leaves me a little bit cold, you know. Could yeah. leave you completely cold. <laughs> if you Figured somebody would get that in. I wouldn't try to. Uh, now, we have uh, material which is donated or given in some way to the a museum and you catalog it in some fashion or other. Can you show us somehow or other where we go from there? Well, for example, we have a collection of <coughs> dresses here that just came in. And uh, let me show you some of these and then we'll explain what we do with them. This dress, for example, uh, might be used by the same style, might be used by modern day youngsters. At least we found that exactly the same hooks that are being worn by teenagers now will fit this dress. You know, I, I know nothing about the material for women's dresses. Would that be taffeta? Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. And a very lovely taffeta. And, now, uh, these, these dresses are not on display at this time. They no. are ready, are being ready for display. That's right. Mm -hmm. When we put them uh, on display, we put them on mannequins like this. Now, I wonder if we're getting a view of this. This is a... 1920s dress, and we are comparing it with a modern dress that you see there. What do you mean, 1958? 1958. What's the you difference? Well, uh, <laughs> that's something that... that uh, I, you know, there's no saying that history repeats itself. I've been reluctant to mention it here, I, uh, but this would seem to be... You wouldn't say vote. that ladies repeat themselves, would Well, you? let me show you this dress. Now, you see you have the same well, line and style. This is about a, of the era of the 1920s. Yes, this is another 1920s. Well, this is probably, then, if this is indicative of what women are going to, maybe this is what our ladies will be wearing this summer. Well, uh, this one is uh, a evening dress. Oh, it is. Oh, dress. Well, it looks, this, is, uh, this is street wear. I see. And uh, this is what they'll be wearing in the evening. This goes back when I can't remember too well, <laughs> and so I wasn't sure. It looked like a summer dress. Uh, are there others on the rack here that you particularly would like us to see? Well, all of uh, these dresses belong to the same collection, and, and uh, we are getting these ready to go into our storage co collection. Well, this, this rack of dresses represents quite a diverse uh, uh, period in history. There's no particular period here, is there? No, no one uh, period. This just simply uh, represents a complete collection. And where we haven't space to put them all on exhibit, we put them in this collection where students and folks who are especially interested in uh, textiles or style or things of that sort, they can come in and see the whole collection. But now you might be uh, interested in seeing how we uh, do an exhibit. An actual display. That's I had thought right. I had seen in another location. And uh, Norman Larson, is, who is our uh, education curator, is working on an exhibit here now. I'll introduce myself. Is this Mr. Larson? Yes, sir. Good. Can you tell us something about your exhibit? This uh, exemplifies, I take it, the kind of thing that we do see in the museum after material has been accessioned and is on display. Uh, yes, it does. This might be uh, said to be killing two birds with one stone, actually. Uh, these two young ladies are, uh, have recently been members of our course in museum practice, which we offer out at Meredith College. Uh, we have an extensive school service program. I don't believe Mrs. Jordan mentioned it to you. Uh, and this is part of our school service program. These two uh, young ladies, uh, Miss Barger over here and Miss Humphreys here, have put this exhibit together as sort of a uh, thesis, term paper, or what, what you will call it. 
Uh, they have taken credit. They have actually, as one of their history courses, gotten credit for coming down here and spending uh, two afternoons a week with us, the whole afternoon, sort of a lab period. So you're opening up another vista of the department, that of training people for various things. Uh, yes, I believe it's very, very well put, Jack. We have a very large program, not only this sort of material, but this sort of procedure. Uh, we have various other school services. We have a uh, slide program series that we send out to the different schools to, uh, that the teachers can show to the youngsters and uh, accompanied by a script and they, they read the script and it, it gives a, a more vivid way of presenting the history of North Carolina to these youngsters. Uh, another way that we have is our craft class. We have an eighth grade uh, craft class, youngsters that have met here on uh, Saturday mornings and they learn the various North Carolina crafts through actually doing them. Uh, if you'd like, I'll take you in and show you one of our uh, exhibits curators working on a loom in here. Uh, this is the sort of thing that we teach the young folks. Well, that's We're an appropriate thing for the state of North Carolina. Uh, weaving, I suppose, dates back uh, to about as early as one can it sure figure. Does. And of course, North Carolina textiles are uh, probably the, well, it is one of our greatest industries. Uh, let's go on in here and we'll look yeah. at this young lady working on the loom. <coughs> This is uh, Mrs. Martha Farley, who is our exhibits curator. And as you can see, she is uh, working on the loom and is uh, actually weaving on a loom that is oh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 150 years old. Uh, she has taught these youngsters how to weave. And uh, while the uh, equipment they use is not the same as the one that you see her working with here now, it's basically the same. The principle is the same. Uh, Mrs. Farley also designs our exhibits and uh, does the actual construction and painting and so forth of them. Is it possible for us to move around uh, so that we might uh, get a picture of the that? Uh, I see some other fascinating facets here of this museum. I wonder if uh, we could move into this area and could. take these a look. Are, uh, these are some guns from our gun collection, Jack. Uh, there's some very other of our school service, uh, another part of our school service program. She is, uh, has probably received a request from some school child for a photograph of a picture of this uh, sort. And she does a good bit of this work. She photographs this sort of material, guns and, and everything and anything that the school children will want. Well, by this particular method of photography, you're able to extend this service, I take it, then out beyond the limits of the museum and on out into oh, the Oh, yes. State. This is, a, is one way of, uh, of spreading around uh, throughout North Carolina and also, I might add, uh, uh, other states the material that we do have here. This I might want to mention to him also, if we may, the traveling exhibits that we send out. Norm, can you say a word? Yes, uh, we have just recently finished a, an exhibit, uh, Mrs. Farley did, on the Indians in North Carolina. It will be sent to the various schools. It is a, uh, the sort of exhibit that uh, the school teacher can put up in her, in her room and it, has, it will have an accompanying script with it. She will be able to take and show to the kids what exactly wh what this uh, is supposed to be by her script and by uh, telling them what, what the exhibit is. And it's a very colorful thing and I think it's one that will be a real big success. So we close out our visit with the Museum of History, one of the more fascinating aspects of the thing. Thank you, Mr. Larson, uh, for demonstrating the various aspects of the museum. Uh, again, I think it's a familiar uh, thing to many people in the state, particularly school children, but you've certainly shown us how it's extended to various other aspects of the state and to the nation. Dr. Crittenden, I think perhaps is this the final division I that we would have visited? I believe this is the end, Jack, and we thank you so much for coming, and we will read your feature story with great interest, well, I assure you. Well, I shall try to do my best. Again, I say I think now that what I felt might be a routine assignment has developed into quite an intriguing one. Well. And uh, may I say to you goodbye, and I think I'll be going out the same door that I came in, right over in this direction. So glad you came. Good night. Good. Good night. Uh, ladies and gentlemen.
have been viewing The Affairs of State. Each Friday evening, WUNC Television, in an effort to promote greater civic understanding, presents the personnel of a Department of State Government and a summary of the duties and responsibilities of their government. Join us again next Friday at this time for another WUNC Television remote telecast on The Affairs of State.